Perfect. Thanks very much, Simon, and uh, hello to everyone joining us live. And uh, this is an introduction to fundamental investing, uh, part three in portfolios. Uh, the objective of the series, the series is to understand the business, then consider its listed shares as an investment and ultimately construct a portfolio of those shares. In the first two parts, we touched on fundamentals, trying to answer the question if a company is good or bad. The second part, we touched on valuations. How much should we pay for that company? Is, is, is it investing in it a cheap or expensive investment? And this, uh, this one this evening, is we're going to look at portfolios, the basics of portfolio construction. As a reminder, um, this series, we don't focus on the mathematics or the formulas or even financial jargon. This is an introductory course. We're introducing high level principles and trying to, trying to weave them together intuitively so that everyone can understand. I do have gray blocks through this, uh, through the slides. And they do have individual um, topics that one can Google and go and research on your own accord. Um, there is a vast, rich body of, of this knowledge out there on the internet. Make use of it. But we are not going to fill uh, this, this, uh, this presentation with that. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into uh, part three, portfolios. I'm briefly going to touch on a reminder of what fundamentals and valuation is and what we're looking for to then take us uh, and to set the scene for building a portfolio, understanding what risk is, going into some themes of diversification, what to do, how to think about it, what to diversify, how to diversify, an example, a basic example of diversification some myths of diversification, and then this concept called optimal diversification before we opening up for some re questions. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully you guys can throw a lot of things at me then. So uh, just a reminder is that when setting out to invest in the stock market, what you want to find is, first of all, you want to find a business that's good quality. And what is good quality? It's a business with high barriers to entry in, in, in its industry. Uh, it has strong competitive advantages against it competitors in that industry, um, preferably with whatever good or service it produces has no substitutes. And this combines into strong uh, pricing power, uh, hopefully uh, within a large total addressable market. We want that large total addressable market because it will allow the business to grow into being a large business. And we as investors get carried along for the ride uh, and generating fantastic returns along that course. Now, these are all background elements about uh, the, the industry sector, economies, uh, and the business model, but we also want to make sure that the business is well run because you can, you can have the best macro setup in the world with the greatest business model in the world. And if you have bad managers running it, it's probably going to do badly. So we want to make sure that the individual business has strong cash generation, uh, appropriate cost structure, appropriate debt or none when in doubt. Remember, debt, debt at an asset or company level uh, is synonymous with risk. Um, and then consider the other major risks. This is how we think about whether a business is good. Next, we will then jump uh, and say, once we found the businesses we want to be invested in, how much should we pay for it? And we want to make sure that we don't overpay for the stock. So the starting point is relative valuations, find a good set of comparative businesses, select logical valuation metrics from these comparators and compare it to, to the, the stock that you're looking at. How does it compare? Is it cheap versus them or expensive versus them? Uh, then we can value it on absolute basis. When we present value, it's expected future cash flows or its expected future dividends, how does that stock compare to that? So this is the background leading into how we select an individual investment. Is it a good investment? Is it a good business? And are we not uh, overpaying for it or are we underpaying for it? But how do we pull that together? How do we go about the process of making a range of these and building a portfolio? Because remember, you don't manage investments, you select investments. What you manage are 
portfolios. What you manage is the portfolio. Of, and a portfolio is a collection of investments, which can include stocks, bonds, properties, commodities, cash, crypto, artworks, um, bottles of wine in your garage, anything that you hold to generate a return can be bundled together and arguably viewed with a collection of all the other things you hold to generate a return as a portfolio. So by definition, portfolio implies more than one investment. Now, why do we have portfolios? Well, the point, simplistically put, the, the point of a portfolio is that the collection of the individual investments should generate a safer return than each individual investment. There are a large number of like, quite complex and academic and far reaching and well written about well documented topics uh, here in terms of portfolios from modern portfolio theory, Markowitz model, risk free rates into the capital asset pricing model, and so on and so on and so on. I'm going to pause briefly here. Uh, as, as, as I mumble these things out so that you can glance at this, but um, I encourage you to come back and have a look at this, uh, this presentation when it is recorded, pause it at this point and go and Google each one of these topics and read about them. There is a rich academic body of work and there's a lot of very intelligent thoughts out there around portfolios and important principles in portfolio construction and portfolio management. I think the two important points in this slide is that you don't manage investments. This process of finding a good business, making sure you don't overpay for it is selecting an investment. You don't manage that, you select it. What you manage is a portfolio. And the reason we manage a portfolio is to make sure that it is safer than each individual investment underlying. What do I mean by safe? And how do you understand this concept? Well, we've got to understand the concept that is risk. And risk is a very slippery topic or concept to understand especially within the context of financial markets, portfolios and making investments. And the best way to understand it is that risk, risk is correlated to the volatility of future outcomes. The greater the range of future outcomes, the greater the risk. Put more simplistically, uh, if you are making an investment or not making an investment, risk is the chance that you are wrong. It is the chance that the investment you bought does badly or the invest investment that you did not buy does well, i.e. it is the chance that the future is not what you expected it to be. And this top right, we have a look at this, uh, this chart, little chart, graphical representation here. If your expected outcome here on the y-axis is, is, is showing you what you think it should be. That's your expected outcome. Any deviation on either side of it, worse or better than your expected outcome is effectively risk. It is the chance of a future outcome differing from your expectations. Therefore, it, if I were to have two assets or two, two things that lay on this curve that you could choose, and one of them you could see here uh, has a far greater reach into the chance of outcomes that it could be away from your expected outcome, that would be riskier than this one that is much closer to your curve of expected outcomes. That's a very academic representation. We're going to touch on this a little bit later. Hopefully, it'll make a bit more sense there. But in essence, risk is the chance that a future outcome differs from expectations. Um, there are a range of other topics to read on this. I'm not going to pause uh, on that. I'm going to move on so that we can unpack how we manage risk. So there is this concept called diversification. Uh, colloquially, we know this as don't put all your eggs in one basket. Now, we know this intuitively. It's not a hard concept to understand. But I'm going to show you guys, and hopefully I explain this well and simplistically, how I can take a statistically 
um, uncertain outcome. And I can just merely using diversification arrive at a certain outcome, which is which hopefully will blow your mind. And what my uncertain outcome is, is flipping a coin. We are, this is an academic uh, example. So we're going to assume the coin cannot magically land and, and hover halfway between heads and tails. The coin is not weighted and there is no cheating involved. This is a perfect academic coin flip, which means that it has exactly 50% chance of landing on heads or 50% chance of landing on tails. Now, if I graphically represent this coin flip and this side of the graph is heads and this side of the graph is tails, the one coin toss is, is a single event and it lies on either side of the curve. Notice how it, it isn't, a isn't bent any way. It is exactly equal on both sides. Uh, and it is flat because it is either this side or that side. Um, now, if you bet on a single coin toss on either heads or tails, you will have a 50% chance of being wrong. What you are doing is betting on an undiversified outcome. You will either be, the coin has to either be heads or tails, that single coin toss. Therefore, you will be 100% right or 100% wrong. That is an undiversified outcome. Now, say I don't bet on a single outcome. Say I bet you that if you are flipping a coin and you flip it not once, but you flip it a hundred times, I bet you that 50% of the times will be tails. The odds are it won't exactly be 50% um it but it'll be very very close but then i extend that and i say what about a thousand coin tosses and as i'm doing this as i'm adding the numbers of coin tosses i'm bending this curve down that was maybe a hundred there and this is maybe a thousand there that's maybe a million there as i hit the concept of infinite coin tosses when you reach infinite coin tosses um, the odds of half those coin tosses being exactly heads and half those coin tosses being exactly tails are absolute. Therefore, instead of betting on a single outcome and possibly being 100% right or 100% wrong, what I've done is I've diversified my outcomes and I've changed an uncertain outcome into a certain outcome. Very academic um, esoteric and statistical example that, but what I'm trying to show you is that with diversification, I can change the odds and start to shift them in my favor. And especially as a diverse investor, you're hopefully not betting on 50-50 outcomes. You're hopefully betting on 70-30 outcomes or 90-10 outcomes or 99-1 uh, outcomes. But I shift those odds in my favor. Um, and I do think this is also an important point. As investors, picking these things, we tend to focus on those things, finding good businesses, underpaying for them, because those are the things that generate returns. So we spend way too much time looking at returns and not enough time considering risk. After finding a potential return, after finding a potential stock, and or a collection of stocks, everything else an investor does is manage risk. And the single greatest tool we have to manage risk as an investor is diversification. It's a key, key tool. So understanding that portfolios are collections of investments, and the reason we have collections of investments is to generate diversification, to lower our risk while making sure the odds are in our favor uh, so that we can generate a portfolio return. What and how do we diversify? Well, intuitively, you diversify by buying different investments, but different to what? So these are things to think about when looking at your portfolio and making portfolio decisions to diversify. The first and obvious one is asset classes. Asset classes 
react differently at different points in economic cycles, they act differently according to different macroeconomic drivers, you can diversify your portfolio using different asset classes, stocks, bonds, properties, cash, commodities, and so on. Um, we, in this fundamental focused uh, series, we are focusing on stocks. So within an equity portfolio, how do we further diversify? Well, Geographic diversification is often touted as important, and especially as South Africans, that is quite key. But consider that where a company is listed is less important than where the business, the underlying business operates. Where does it generate its revenues, its cash flows? Where does its assets lie? Drive geographic diversification but not in terms of where things are listed, in terms of where things operate, where the businesses lie. Then consider diversification at industry and sector level. Besides all the different sectors and industries, uh, consider that some of them are cyclical and some of them are defensive. Then we could dr drill down to even more specific risks. The obvious topical ones are COVID and lockdowns. Which ones are more susceptible and which ones actually perhaps, perhaps benefit out of uh, COVID and lockdowns? Other big uh, known unknowns in the macro horizon are electronic vehicles versus fuel cells, tr the green energy transition, disruption, investment styles, anything you're uncertain about or anything that may play out in different ways are things you want to diversify. Then how do we go about diversifying? Well, there is no perfect way to do this, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to provide a couple of theories about how to go about and, and logic on practical ways to diversify our portfolio. One of the ways to, is to utilize a benchmark. Your starting point is what does the market hold? If, you, if your portfolio is in the JSC, what is the JSC look like? What does the all share of the top 40 look like? Then start that, with that as your blueprint. Avoid the stocks that you don't want to hold. Go very overweight on the ones you do, you do want to hold and perhaps on the ones you borderline go underweight. And, or maybe, maybe that is a process to do, uh, to diversify your portfolio. Core and satellite also works. Work out what your long-term, in, in Simon's words, death to us part, long-term core portfolio is. And then outside of that, make tactical bets around that portfolio to, to either hedge it against events or to give you exposures to other parts that you don't have that you think for the next five or 10 years might work or use a core and satellite approach. Negative selection is also an interesting way to go about. Look at the market and then consider what you definitely don't want to hold. Then go and hold some of everything else. And perhaps you go over and underweight on those things. There is obviously a hybrid approach, a little bit of all of the above. Make your core long-term holding a globally diversified ETF or, or an ETF or whatever benchmark you want, you want to manage against. Um, and then make your individual investments being your tactical satellite bets around that core, stock picking. There is no one way to diversify. Uh, these are just some examples. Whatever works for you will make sense. But I think the very, very important thing is consider that, that you want to hold, I'm going I'm to explain this in very, different context, in very different ways. You want to hold different investments. Um, you want to hold a basket of good investments that are as lowly correlated together. Um, and you want to control for the risks you don't want, but there's nothing wrong with holding, taking a risk if you back it and that's the risk you want to take, but make sure that they are conscious risks. So now we know portfolio is a collection of assets. We do that to manage risk with a key tool of diversification. Uh, we consider key things to diversify I'm going to give you a visual example of what a, what a two-stock portfolio on the JSE could look like. So I've used Anglo Gold Ashanti and Sassel as my two-stock portfolio. And in this starting year, this time period is 10 years. It's a decade of investing. And at the start of this period, I held 
both shares uh, of equal amounts. You can see that Sassel has been wild and outperformed at the beginning and then collapsed off at the be uh, end. And though gold underperformed and then shot up again, they wildly volatile. What is interesting is the, the portfolio that is half of each of them is a, is a surprisingly stable line in the middle. Um, so you could see how the risks in one have offset the other and they've actually moved in opposing uh, ways. Now, I've cheated a little bit because gold is a negatively correlated asset in theory. It isn't always. Correlations are fluid and they move around. And in fact, if, for those statistical people watching this who know what this is and those who, who are not, go and Google this phrase so that you know what I mean. But if you track the correlation coefficient against Anglo, Anglo Gold, Asante, and Sassel, you get negative. 0.75, meaning that when one goes up, the other tends to go down by 0.75%. But it's just a visual example of how a two stock and a, a, a two stock portfolio can offset each other's risks and you can get a much smoother outcome. Now, obviously, uh, you want a smoother outcome where the Portfolio is going up and not sideways, but this is just a visual representation of what a two-stock portfolio can do. Um, diversification is great, but there are some myths that get propounded and sold to investors all over the world and not, aren't necessarily correct. You can have too much of a good thing. The first myth is that you can never be too diversified. Consider for a moment the practical implications of going out there and buying investments. You pay brokerage, there's transactional costs. You need to know what you're buying. You need to, you, uh, there's, there's, there are a lot of things and I, I collectively put them together in a basket that I call frictional costs. You can hold too many individual assets. Now an ETF might be a route into that but it's not a perfect route either. It's got its own costs and spreads and which ETFs do you hold? And, and they have limited um, underlyings as well. So the concept of you can never be too diversified is incorrect. You can, there is a practical point from frictional costs where it becomes too expensive. How much, where, and, and through whom, and how many should you hold? These are much, these as a practical problem, you need to consider these things practically and only you can answer that once you've, once you've crunched the numbers and looked at your circumstances and your routes into the market and the tools available to you. The other myth is that the diversification benefits of assets offset other risks. So you can just keep adding assets to a portfolio and you'll keep lowering the risk. This is not entirely true. If you have a portfolio of really well-diversified, good quality investments, and they are well-diversified already, the addition of increasing numbers of inferior investments to this portfolio, they may increase the diversification, but they will increase the diversification at marginal diminishing amounts that are more than offset by dropping the quality of the investments that you hold because these are inferior investments. So you'll get a slightly more diversified portfolio, but at increasingly lower returns because you're lowering the quality. This is an important point. Each individual investment in your portfolio should stand on its own individual merits. Don't add something to a portfolio only to diversify it. If that's the only reason you're buying that thing, stand back and consider whether if this was the only asset you're buying, whether you'd be buying it. And the odds are probably not. And in which case you could be adding inferior assets to a superior portfolio and arriving at what Peter Lynch likes to call diversification. Two, two good rules of thumb, hold what you want to hold. Do not hold what you do not want to hold. Take conscious risks. For the risks you're uncertain about, diversify them out. Take conscious risks. Only take the risks you're comfortable to take and diversify the rest out. 
there is this concept called optimal diversification. This is a very academic and retrospective uh, view of the world, but it is useful to visualize it. If you simulate a portfolio of a series of assets with nearly infinite combinations thereof, they will create a scatter plot of expected returns and expected volatilities of these assets. And you can then start to track them. And this, this portfolio, each of these dots is a portfolio of a combination of assets. And this dot over here can generate a decent little return and a reasonable volatility. But if you notice a slightly different combination of assets, can generate the same return at a lower volatility. And that is a good thing. If you could generate the same return at less risk, you should always do that. That is more valuable return. Because remember, you want to get as close as possible to uh, your expected outcome. So more volatility means more, more chance of being either side of, of this curve. You want to tighten this curve as closely as possible to your expected outcome. So take the least amount of risk and generate the maximum amount of return. Now, as we com combine these assets, we can start to shave off more and more and more and more risk. And there is a practical point where you cannot. And when you, when you plot all these practical points where the only way to generate more return is to take more risk is what they call the efficient frontier. And that is the best possible portfolio you can take depending on your risk profile. As you move up in terms of return, you take more risk and you're being paid for that risk. And you're being optimally paid for that risk that you're taking. Our objective is to take the minimum amount of risk to generate the maximum amount of return. What that is, how they will play out is up to you to call. So in terms of summary and conclusion, our objective as investors is to go and find a good investment and hold a collection of these good investments and manage them in a portfolio where these good investments share as little in common as possible. I'll run through it quickly. Portfolios are collections of assets, risk, is the chance that a future outcome differs from expectations. And diversification in portfolios is key to in managing risk. And then in markets, expectations are returns. Um, we use diversification to manage against those. And in essence, it is not holding all your eggs in one basket. Consider what you are diversifying carefully. Consider optimal diversification. Take conscious risks and hedge out and diversify out all the other risks that you don't want to take. And at the core, though, in a portfolio, individual investments should stand on their own merits, irrespective of diversification. Just briefly before we move to questions, uh, I want to show you two high-level views of major indices well, one major index in the world and one major index in South Africa, and how we would assume an index is not uh, concentrated and how our index is diversified and how, in fact, that can be an illusion. The NASDAQ 100 is the top 100 largest companies listed on the NASDAQ. And if you have a look at the top eight, they are over 50% of the index. That means 92% of the other shares are, 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 are less than 50%. So if you're investing in the NASDAQ, you're investing in big tech, basically. The JSC top 40 is slightly different. NAS, uh, NASPERS in process have dropped in, in, in concentration. In fact, Richmond is now the largest uh, holding in the top 40. So you would say, oh, gosh, I'm making a concentrated bet on Richmond in the top 40. Not really. Well, it is quite, quite large in the top 40. But the moment you step away from the stocks and you have a look at the in industry, the sector exposure in the top 40, you're making a large bet on industrials and financials. And industrials and financials collectively make up 52% of the JSC top 40, and both of them are cyclical industries. Remember, in terms of what to diversify, we're not just diversifying individual stocks. 
we want to diversify industry and sector exposure. When taking risks, be conscious of which risks you're taking um, and make sure you're not taking mistaken risks uh, or, or inadvertent uh, risks. Anyhow, in summary, what you want to find is good businesses. Make sure you don't overpay for them, preferably that they are cheap and hold a collection of them that are as individually different as practically possible to construct a portfolio. The next part, uh, coming back in January, we're gonna have a very brief case study. And more importantly, we're gonna have the bulk of, of, of uh, that presentation or the webinar as a Q&A. Please email through questions to Simon and we'll compile those and try to address them in, in the presentation. And if you're there live, um, ask them live. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll get through a lot of those. Uh, but uh, looking forward to that, but I wanna open up for questions now. Uh, email to simon at justonelap.com. A uh, question from Adam, and he's asking, is there a perfect number of shares or guidelines as to how many shares to have in, in, in a portfolio? So that's an interesting question, and it's one I can answer practically, and it's one I can answer academically. Ac academically, um, normal distribution, and normal distribution is the bowl-shaped curve where you get a nice spread of assets, um, is reached at a sample of 30. Um, they have okay. proven, they have proven in large markets, if one takes, if one individually picks 30 random stocks from totally, and these must be from very different sectors, that you're not duplicating sectors and duplicating exposures, but you can get pretty broad, pretty close to diverse, diversified outcomes then. Um, now, a little closer to home, our market is a little smaller and more concentrated, uh, I think you can achieve that with 20 to 30. Um, but at the same time, we do have mechanisms to get broader ranges uh, like ETFs and funds that you can, you can invest into and then go and select differently uh, and, and make those satellite bets outside of those. Um, but at the same time, your outcomes can be very, very different. You, the best way to think about it is the less diversified your portfolio, the greater the odds are that your return will differ from the markets. Yeah. Now, that may be higher or lower, and the market's return may not be great. It may, may be high or it may be low. So it, the point is it will just differ. Um, and, and, and the more stocks you hold and the closer you get to 30, 40, 50, and then infinity and all the stocks that are listed in the world, the more you just start to reflect the market. Um, so good question. The, the data indicates you should be able to achieve that with a basket of about 30 stocks, so long as you are very careful in making sure that those stocks are diversified. You're not duplicating risks with them. Yeah, I, I take your point on that. So, I mean, I, the way I've structured, and Tabang, this comes to a degree to the question you've just held now. I mean, I have a core of ETFs uh, in my tax-free and discretionary. And that's about 60, 58, 60% of my portfolio. In fact, it's probably a little lower because my portfolio has had a really good year. Um, and then I look for about 10 or 12 stocks, sort of my death just part, and then about six or eight uh, second tier. And I note that I'm currently holding 16 uh, stocks in total. Um, so I use ETF sort of as that, that core, as Keith was talking about, and then individual stocks. And I, I will duplicate them. I, you know, for example, I've got uh, Capitec. It's in the top 40. I, I have got uh, uh, Discovery. It's in the top 40. So there is some duplication better with, with, with ShopRite. In other words, I'm increasing my bet on that one, uh, on, on those in, in, in particular, because I hold them via Citrix 40. Keith, your, your thought on holding stocks that are already in an ETF that you've got? So, so the best way to think about that is if the ETF is your benchmark, you're, you're changing the weighting. Yeah. So, so in fact, by the way, you can buy an ETF and short the stock. In other words, you've gotten the rest of the ETF and you've cut out that stock from the ETF. So you could do that. So, so don't view your portfolio as an ETF and a stock. 
Mm -hmm. Your portfolio is a see-through of both merged together. So if, if for example, uh, and Richmond uh, touched on that is 16% in the top 40 and you hold a uh, top 40 ETF, uh, Satrix 40, and then you go and buy uh, more Richmond, what you've done is you've increased Richmond's weighting in your portfolio. So by all means, do that, but be conscious about that decision. Make sure you know if you hold ETFs or you hold funds, know what their underlyings are so that if you go and buy that share, you know that you either don't have exposure to it anywhere else or you do and you're comfortable doubling up on it. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly important. Yeah, that's exactly my logic. I mean, ShopRite, I'm more than happy to be effectively I'm overweight ShopRite on my benchmark. Um, and I never bought NASPAS or Process because they were so significant in my benchmark and I already had 20 odd percent. So I, I didn't particularly want any more of that. Uh, but, but, uh, and, and uh, sorry, Simon, yeah. uh, Simon, just jumping, jumping in. And this is part of my point is that you pick investments. You don't manage investments. You actually manage portfolios. That's what you yes. do. So this is a dynamic process. So maybe today you think that's a good idea. And in five years time, you think it's a bad one. So sell that stock, change it, shift around and, and manage your portfolio. Um, that's about managing risk, manage that entity. Yeah. And then for, for my offshore ETFs, I don't stress it because I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I don't worry about that. A question coming around, what percentage of portfolio recommend for cryptocurrency? In essence, crypto is alternative assets. Uh, and rule of thumb on that is usually single percentages um, and, and, you know, three, four, five, I don't know, something around there. Keith, fair enough on that point? So, so there's, there's a nice line in terms of optimal diversification. This efficient frontier can be seen as uh, the best portfolio, but notice as you come down the portfolio curve, you get slightly less return, but you get significantly less volatility mm. um, until you hit about here and then it reverses around. Uh, what, what this curve is, is as you shift down it, you can sleep better at night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ask yourself, it's the wrong question to ask me what I think my crypto allocation should be. You've got to ask yourself, at what point can't you sleep at night? Yeah. How did and, you feel on Saturday and, when Bitcoin lost 20%? Exactly. The sleep test is a very good test about um, where you are. Are you taking too much risk? Um, that's all. Don't, don't worry about it. Change it. Go and yeah. actively change your allocation. I, I sold down until you sleep, 100%. Eldrich is asking a split between local and offshore. Um, or is that, I mean, for, for us, I mean, typically as South Africans, we're overweight local because, you know, Reg 28, home bias. I mean, most investors are overweight their local market. That's a, it was a great paper I read a long time ago. Pretty much investors are overweight their, 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 their home markets. Do you look at that? And he's particularly asking for next year. I don't know if you want to stick your neck out for next year, but that, that distinction between what is truthfully a very, very small South African market versus a giant rest of the world. So, and it's going to date it if I start making forecasts in this. What I want to do is give you the tools to make that decision for yourself. Mm -hmm. I go back to geographic diversification. It doesn't matter where a company is listed. It matters where it generates its earnings, its cash flows, and where its assets lie. Um, and if you have a look at the top 40 as an example, and most people yeah. when they talk about our local market, they are talking about the top 40, about 60% of the top 40's earnings come from outside of South Africa. Yeah. So if all you do is you have 100% of your income or 100% of your equity investment in the top 40, you actually have about 40% or 60% of it offshore, even though it's listed here. So I think more options are better than less. I take money offshore and we at Integral Asset Management, we run offshore portfolios and it's, it's great to have more com individual companies to be able to buy and invest in. The odds of finding a good one is higher, but it is easy enough within a domestic perspective to diversify geographically and, and with currency just using, using what our local tools. Um, I would absolutely not ignore offshore. Um, there is a big vibrant market out there. Don't mm -hmm. concentrate your assets. Consider, consider geographic diversification one of your risks. 
and yeah. diversify. No, absolutely. And I remember from when, when Greek was Greece was threatened to default and there was a Greek bottler. They basically they bottled Coke for Europe. Um, and and Canon asset managers were buying it hand over fist because the market had completely slammed it. And they were like, nope, the fact that it's in Greece is neither here nor there. It's actually a European play. Graham, you're asking a minimum number of shares. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, is in terms of, of value of transaction, essentially you need to get your transaction fees below 1%. Uh, and that is easy enough these days. Yeah, the, 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 a lot of broke, most brokers are under a percent. And of course, easy equities is, is really, really cheap. No bowls, no whistles there, but uh, if, if it, it works in that regard. Question coming, Keith, to, to please explain the individual investments should explain further. Individual investments should still stand on their own merits, irrespective of diversification. In other words, you buy a share because it's a brilliant share, not because you've got too many miners and now you need a grocer. So, uh, and I have a mental mental test I mean, that, that I put each investment through that I put into my portfolio um, or client portfolios as well. And if this was the only share I could buy, would I still be comfortable buying it? Now, in some instances, that's, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's almost mm-hmm. too harsh a test, but it does help you think about it this way because then... Each individual investment is a good investment. You're, you're once again shifting the odds in your favor. There is no certainty of outcome in the stock market. This is or any market or with any investment. This is not how an uncertain future works. By definition, things can go wrong. So our objective as, a, as an investor is to shift the odds in our favor. One of the ways we do that is by picking good investments. The other way we do that at a portfolio level is by diversifying, diversifying each of those individual good investments. Do you see how that's two layers of risks are mitigating? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that's a, that's an important principle. If you find yourself going buying buying an investment with the sole reason, oh, I've got too much of this and this and this and this, but uh, I've got none of that. I should hold some of that. That's a terrible reason to buy something. It, it, it should be attractive in its own right. So us, you know, just because something is listed doesn't mean you need to be invested in it. Uh, yeah. Some of my best investment <laughs> decisions have not been, have been to not invest in uh, yeah. companies. Yeah. Uh, question around Stellar Capital, not one I particularly, I don't follow at all, and I don't particularly want to get into individual stocks. Uh, how, how do you know when you diversified enough? Keith, I suppose that's when you start hitting the, the 20 or 30 stocks in your portfolio. At that point, you're probably hitting enough. Yeah, so, and that's that's actually an excellent question. Do you measure this thing? Do you arrive at the right amount of volatility? You know, I mean, or capital loss of you, that's how you define your risk. Um so I go back to the sleep test. Can you sleep if the market collapsed and the economy went into recession tomorrow? Could you sleep? Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's if you can. That's a good amount of diversification. Uh, and then practically, um, do you do you have enough assets in your portfolio that you can sleep at night, but not too many that you you can sit down and explain to me why you hold each individual one and tell me what the latest news is on it. Um, and Because then you've got a good balance between the two uh, where, you, where you're concentrated enough to have selected investments you back, mm-hmm. but diversified enough, you can weather cycles and you, can, you, you, you should be able to handle everything. Um, I find 20 to 30 stocks on a global setting. Um, and balancing this with some ETFs and broad exposures and perhaps some thematic plays. And then we, we do hold some other asset classes as well. Bonds are very, very useful. They may be boring, but they're very, mm-hmm. very useful for correlations. Um, and especially when you can get strong real yields and things like that. So consider those facts. And cash, cash is a valid asset class. Yeah. Um, it may not be an exciting one until the market crashes and everyone's was, scrambling. I was going to say it was very exciting in March last year. <laughs> it was your it was your best asset class. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> did wonderfully. Um, a, a question, it's sort of coming through and, and from a couple of different directions, but sort of Clarence is, is talking around the complexity and, and and to tie into what you're saying, Keith, there as well. I mean, part of the challenges is is also you know me and you. This is what we do. 
most of the people in this webcast, uh, you know, looking at stocks and markets is not what they do. They have lives and then that this is almost their, their sort of part time and, and and the challenge with that is is managing it and i've got a couple of thoughts on it just to key's point you've got to know your companies for example if you held avenge and were surprised to see the price jump yesterday it's a problem you should have known that there was a consolidation coming that it was happening effective yesterday you've got to have that time and that 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 you know to, to do it and and you know and that might actually limit the number of stocks that you can have because 30 stocks is 60 sets of results and per year, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's the case of, well, then ramp your ETFs up to, I don't know, 70, 80, 90%, and just have a few little stocks, which on their own, not many, but they're small in the overall portfolio. And Clarence was talking around tools for valuations and recommending buyers and sells for those norm, normal in the, in, in the civvy streets. So, Clarence, it is a challenge. And I'm going to give Keith a moment as well. I mean, you know, Obviously, there is there's dozens of websites and stuff. There are, you know, my my stockbroker, Standard Bank, lets me do a search on various different fundamental metrics, etc. Uh, and, and that's useful. But the the ultimate valuation is often more than just cash flows and and, and debt levels, and those are important. But there's a whole bunch to it. And what we don't have in South Africa, we do, but n nothing that really stands out to me is that idea of, of a, a, you know, like the Motley Fool in the US or the uh, fat profits in, in Australia. Um, but what we do have then, of course, is the collective investment schemes, hedge funds, unit trusts, et cetera, which kind of the theory is do it on your behalf. Absolutely. So if you don't have time to do that, you can, for example, either go the passive route and just buy the asset class because that's actually what the passive route is. B besides clever other bells and whistles that can sometimes put on it when you're allocating to, for example, an equity ETF, if it is sufficiently diversified, low cost, and it has, it has a accurate tracking error. So low tracking error, and it's a good ETF. You're buying an asset class um, and you're yeah. getting your equity exposure. And that's, that's nice. And, and then, you know what, if all you have is time to research one or two stocks a year, do that. You don't, you don't need to be an active manager yourself. Um, or if you want that active risk, that conscious risk taking, remember the point about portfolio, the point about investing is not to not take risk. It's to mm -hmm. take conscious risk and to make sure you're getting paid for the risk you're taking consciously. It's, it's nothing is worse than a lucky or an unlucky outcome. Uh, yeah. you, actually, you actually want to shift odds in your favor. So but maybe what you do is you put, put half in an ETF and half with an active manager and you don't pick any stocks. Um, and you're all right to go with that. Um, you need to make that decision yourself. Um, this, this series should give you a range of tools to at least think about that. Um, and if not, do it yourself. Uh, scrutinize um, where you're allocating and who's going to be doing it for you, uh, which is also important. Uh, and perhaps, perhaps that's a way of thinking about it. And I like that point, know the risks. When I, when I invest in companies, I, 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 I draw a list of what I think the risks are. And if they happen, they're not nice, but at least they're not a surprise. What the last thing I want is something which I hadn't seen coming along, either good or bad. I mean, the good one, at least it doesn't hurt financially, but but you want to know what those potential risks are. Um, Karen's asking around chasing dividends uh, via uh, ETFs, perhaps dividend aristocrats or something. The, the second part of the, in fact, I've got a couple of different. So the one is saying, are all ETFs equal when it comes to dividends? Yes, in the sense that they pay the dividend out less the, the management fee. In that sense, they're equal. But of course, some ETFs are, you know, some indices uh, are paying much lower dividend. Uh, some are geared for dividends. Um, some are, are pref tracks, which tracks preference shares, which is designed not for capital appreciation so much as opposed to, to dividend yield. So they're equal in terms of they pay it out. They're not necessarily equal in terms of the actual yield. The question around chasing dividends if dividends are a focus of your portfolio, there certainly are some ETFs. But then also understand, you mentioned the Aristocrats uh, dividend fund. 
they're not chasing high dividends. They use dividends as a quality metric. So it's not a very high yield. If the, the high yields locally is the, the, the Divi Plus from Satrix, which is a bit of a contrarian ETF. Um, and then, of course, the Pref Tracks, which is a core shares one, which literally just buys uh, uh, the preference shares. But again, you know, is it better with individual stocks? Keith, I mean, I, I know, for example, you've, you, you had held a bunch of, of preference shares and you much preferred the individual preference share because you could assess risk, you could assess yield, et cetera. And, and I could change the weighting. Um, mm-hmm. And I found there was a large amount of yield leakage uh, in, in, the, in, in the preference share ETF. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd, and I have, and, I, and still, still across, across the book, we hold uh, preference shares, the very, very useful uh, instruments, albeit a shrinking market. But yeah. changing, I mean, something I, I didn't touch on is that risk can be defined differently in financial markets. And the academic definition of risk is volatility. But if you talk to the value investors, they will say that volatility is not a risk, <laughs> capital losses. Um, but there's other types of risk. There's, there's a risk of income loss. Um, if, you have, if you're a fund manager, risk of underperformance against a benchmark is, is also a risk. Mm. But in this, in this question, asking about dividends, if you're investing for dividends, you have, you're investing for income. And that means that um, you need to assess the risk of those dividends not being paid. Um, and that's, that's a different type of, a different way of thinking of that risk. I mean, there were, there were lots of people who were invested in Anglo-American for the, for the 50 years of dividends that paid until the credit crisis hit and they skipped their dividend. Um, and suddenly you realize that even though the risk is low, it's not zero that these dividends get skipped. I like mm-hmm. the aristocrats index. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm invested and we've got clients invested in the aristocrats index. I back it not just as a yielding uh, index, but for the reason Simon spoke about, where that dividend is hard proof of the quality of the underlying businesses. Yeah. Um, and that tangible proof means that you get this really good quality, actually slightly defensive and slightly old school um, underlying portfolio. And also in a world with declining interest rates, um, dividend yields can't go negative. So what you can get is you get the <laughs> elements that uh, where uh, dividend yields can, especially if you're buying the aristocrat, so aristocrats index as, as a yielding index, you c- valuations can start to go absolutely crazy, absolutely bubble-like in a world that's reaching for yield because all, all the bonds in the world are negatively yielding um, and yes, inflation hedged, so which is nice as a company. So that's a very long way around, but... Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Investing for dividends is a valid way of going about it, but you need to I go back to think of what the risks are and make sure that the ones you're not comfortable with, you either avoid or diversify out and then take, take the conscious risks for the rest um, and make sure you're getting paid for those. Yeah, I mean, I invest, I, I, I invest a bit for income, but not because I need the income for living, but because I then redeploy that income. Um, and Metrofile was one of them. And at some point when they, they ran into issues in their Kenyan acquisition, the, the, the dividend disappeared. And that you know, was deeply distressing, but didn't hurt my lifestyle. It's also dividends are expensive in terms of tax. They have 20% tax rate, whereas capital gains, if you are in the top, top, top bracket, uh, is 18% and your first 40K is free. So there's, there's, there, there, there's a whole process and structure around you know, g- g- getting smart when, when one's looking uh, for income as, as to, to live on rather than, you know, for me, the income just goes straight back into the market. And don't forget, bonds are very valid, especially South African bonds that are yielding very high currently are, are very valid income generating uh, instruments. Uh, don't forget that if you're going only for income, do not forget the other asset classes, bonds, preference shares. Um, yeah, the, the, these, these are valid. Um, yeah. Getting income solely out of equity is actually very risky. Yeah, and government retail bonds, I think, are 9.75% at the moment for a five-year and, lock-in. And you can get inflation-linked ones because what yeah. is your big risk with a fixed income instrument? Well, there's counterparty and credit risk, but your 
assuming that's fine, your real long-term risk is inflation. Your capital gets eroded. In Inflation-linked ILBs, or what the bond traders call linkers, mm. um, are, are a good way around that. In the States, they call them TIPS. Yeah. And at the moment, I think it's at the 10 year is inflation plus four and a half percent, which is which is not shabby. Um, Tabang, biggest risk is not investing at all. Agree with that. Clarence, recommend 100%. Stockbroker market, uh, you guys will put forward uh, trust and fees into account, consistent high performance yields. So, I mean, I know dozens. The, the only one I know of any is, is Keith. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I talk to them on my show every morning, et cetera, et cetera. Honestly, don't know how great they're doing. But hit up Chris. I have a chat with Keith at Integral. Uh, see what he has to say. Um, any good source of information investing in bonds for first timers? I mean, the key thing with bonds is understand yield up, price down, price up, yield down. That, that's the only thing I know about bonds. Uh, bonds are a very tricky tricky market and maybe one day we should do uh, a yeah. series a, a, a series on on fundamental investing in bonds and understand over the years i've learned a lot about bonds but i'm also not i'm i'm tend to be an equity investor um i use bonds they're a valid, valid instrument and we can go out on the on, on the curve and we can use uh, offshore bonds and onshore and the like and we use them for valid mechanisms within portfolio construction but um but it's quite a specialized topic um and this is really an equity fo focused series so good question but i think that's that's a whole nother series, that one. <laughs> yeah. And, and the thing is as well to understand with bonds, and I don't want to go too much down that rabbit hole, but understand that bonds are, if you're buying in the secondary market, so if you go to the government retail bond website and you buy a bond and you hold it to expiry, you will get your money back and you will get your interest promised unless there's a default by government. But if you're buying in the secondary market, as we've seen, for example, rates go up, et cetera, bonds are losing value. In other words, you, you, you run the risk of losing money. Um, with bonds, they're not the the your only risk is default risk. There are other risks there as well. I don't, I don't actually know even any bond traders. Truthfully, um, I know we've done it, but Gareth, if you head to to go on to just one lap, I know Christia did a couple of of fat wallet shows on bonds um, and 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 investing into bonds because she she swears that they're not boring. So there, there was a couple no? of there. So if you search around there, you'll find some. Bond, bonds are certainly useful. Uh, and if you have a look at global bond markets, especially the US bond market, um, ignoring the last year or so, um, we've been in a really strange place for the last decade where bonds have been generating equity-like returns without equity-like risk yeah. um, because we've had falling interest rates globally and things like that. Does it continue? Um, I mean, these and where... Uh, yeah, th these are big questions and they are hard ones to answer. And the entire world filled with people way smarter than me and Simon and way more educated on this are, are currently debating how this will play out. Um, and they don't have answers. But it's, <laughs> it is absolutely a valid asset class. Do not ignore it if you want to diversify across asset classes. Yeah. And Clarence, the inflation link bonds, you're right there. And, and they're quite like what they do is the capital increases by the inflation rate, and then they pay an interest on top of that. So your, your interest rate is set at, in the case of the one I was referring to, the retail government bond, four and a half percent annualized for the, the duration. But what you get is that every six months when they pay that interest, they increase the capital by the amount that inflation has gone up. So, I mean, for, for, for the right, for the right uh, 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 part of a portfolio, for the right investor, they are, they are really, really great because one of your risks in, in an income uh, portfolio is, 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 is uh, 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 inflation. Um, you can either ETF that invest in bonds. Yeah, so there is the, so, so the ETFs are secondary market, which brings in some of that risk. Um, the retail bonds are deeply boring. I mean, I bought some last year in April simply because they were offering 11.5% for five years. And in April of last year, uh, we had no idea what was going to happen. In hindsight, I could have bought almost anything and done a whole lot better. But uh, nonetheless, you know, it, 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 at the time, it was a, it was some, it was a worthwhile thing to do. Um, Simon, if I can just jump in with a little bit of yeah. personal finance as well, because this is predominantly a retail audience 
you need to consider if you're thinking about investing in bonds, you need to consider paying off your bond first if you've got one as well, because that's well, risk yeah. free. There, there is risk free return saving on the interest you would have been charged on that bond instead of going out there and taking further risk. Because if you're holding a, if you've got a mortgage on your property and you're going and buying a bond, indirectly, what you've actually done is geared yourself up to buy that bond. Instead mm -hmm. of taking the capital you would have put into the bond and paying off your property. So mm -hmm. one of the reasons my portfolio, my personal portfolio has um, no bond allocation and it has very small property allocation is because I own my primary residence and I've got a mortgage on it. So therefore, I both have bond exposure and if I want fixed income exposure, I pay off my bond. And, and I allocate capital into that. And if I want property exposure, well, I already have it. I own the house I live in. And that's part of my portfolio. The house I live in is an asset. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you, I, I don't want to be overweight property in the market if I'm, if I'm really overweight property because I own it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you just kicked open a rabbit hole there because, dude, talk about concentration risk. And then the whole debate is, yeah. uh, is, 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 is that, a, a, yeah, there we will park that there, folks. We have hit time, so we're going to leave it there. I uh, appreciate everyone. Uh, uh, it, it, was a, it was a great hour. Keith, really, really enjoyed the, the time. As I said, we are back again uh, in the new year. If you're here, you are booked for that one as well. And please email through questions. Yeah, questions to me, simon at justonelap.com. The previous two videos are online. The link is just going into the chat box right now. Um, you'll find them there. Other videos, find the integral ones, and you'll be in business with that. Uh, ladies and gents, uh, I hope everyone has a, a great holiday season. I hope you're holidaying. If not, then uh, I'm imagining you're working through, in which case, thanks to you because that means Keith and I can go on holiday, uh, although Keith a week ahead of me. Keith, really appreciate it. That was excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate the time.